So I apologize. I'm coming off a 24 plus hour flight, so my voice is dead. Normally I would avoid this for exactly that reason. I uh, just try and shout at the back of the room, but you'll have to forgive. Um, I'm going to try and be quick today because what I was asked to do was create a presentation on the fundamentals of game design. And these are things that I think we can uh, address quickly and then go over your questions. Um, because I feel like the Q&A time is really where the value is. So, let's talk briefly. First off, for any of you guys who don't know, my name is James Portnow. I write for some stuff. I do a show, which some of you guys may have seen. Um, I speak places. Uh, I hold a professorship at DigiPen, uh, which is the number two game school in the United States. And uh, I run a games on consulting firm called Rainmaker Games, and work on games ranging from Farmville to Call of Duty series. Uh, so that's me in a nutshell. But what I've done far less important than what we're going to talk about. So, how many of you guys desire to be game designers? How many of you guys are game designers? Um, when we talk about game design, uh, and especially about our job, our title, what we do, we talk a lot about this work. We almost never talk about this work. That's the important thing. Um, so, be nice. What is this? Anyone, thoughts, shout them out. Because to me, right, our meetings interactive. So should our conferences be. There's no reason why I should be trying to impart knowledge to you. You guys have as much to give back to me. So anyway, thoughts. What is design? Assemble components. Wait, right, check it out. Assemble components to get a result. So assemble components for a result. What else? The capacity uh, to assemble the thinking in system, a system, component that not only uh, are there, they interact. So, Delivering a system, yes. To meet the, 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 the expectation of the people who want to make games. Can you all hear everybody in the back? No, not at all. Alright, come on. We're going to do this. Where is the power button on this? <laughs> Can you all hear me in the back? Yeah. yeah. Alright, great. As a designer, you should be able to get the back of any room, even if you're running off 24 hours of jet lag. Speak <laughs> <laughs> up. All right, so to me, design is simply creation with purpose. We wouldn't take a random pile of lumber, start beating it together with a hammer and nails, and hope to get a house. But for some reason, this is very often how we seem to approach design, uh, specifically game design. Um, so my first question to you guys is, who are you designing for? Anyway. The players. players. Excellent, you're players. Yes. Uh, you're designed for real human beings. You're designed for other people. People who work like you, who have psychology. Who you can really build something for. These aren't, these aren't mystical entities out there. They're your player base. That's your community. And the key question you have to ask at all times is, how am I engaging my player? This is, this is the fundamental problem you're always trying to solve in your life. Every time you give me a project, every time that you have a question, this is where you go back to. So, saying, I want to build a platform, isn't enough. And yet I see this all the time, even in tens of millions of dollars of projects, I see this begin from this sort of state. So who recognizes this picture? <laughs> we got a couple of you guys. Um, if you haven't and you're a game designer, you should read the design of everyday things. Uh, great book. But, this is the problem. This, the masochist teapot is what you're doing if you're just saying, I want to create a platform. Well, it's like saying I want to build a teapot without thinking about what a teapot's for, what it does. You actually want to deliver to your end user when you're creating. Saying something along the lines of, I want to deliver to my players a series of reflex-based challenges that are easily intuitable because they understand the underlying mechanics, uh, because they mirror actions in their daily lives. This is a much closer start, right? This is a much uh, more honed definition. This is a certain place that you should be uh, trying to get to when you are uh, starting out on your project. Um, because this, this helps you define where your core engagement is, how you're engaging your players. And if your players are these guys, 
Well, yeah, you're probably moving platformer because, well, they understand running a jump. The player's that guy. Uh, you might be building a shooter or a racing game, right? Um, but the answer is different, right? A platformer is not is not your coverall answer because platform doesn't talk about engagement. Many different platforms engage in many different ways. What you care about is not the overarching scheme of the game, what it, what it seems like on the surface, but what it delivers to the person who's going to end up using it. So when you're making decisions in the game, when you're actually building out your product, how do you decide if your decisions are reasonable? Anyone, any thoughts? Yes, right there. Oh, hey, 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 hit me all the way back here. Uh, maybe um, if your idea is maybe if your idea is reasonable for uh, the kind of thing that you're using, for the kind of money you have, the kind of time you have, for the experience you want to bring the player. So uh, that's it's very good, right? The you should all as designers have an answer to this question, right? I should I should ask this question and. You guys should all be clamoring to answer. It, because if you're a designer, right, you need to know how to judge your own decisions. This is clearly a key skill. Um, but I mean, I, I agree with the statement that was made. To me, there's sort of a, a catch out of production, right? Um, I have four things I look at. I look at my budget, my schedule, the amount of complexity my decisions add to the game, and how much they add as far as the game. Um, I do these in a hierarchical order because uh, budget, how much does this decision cost in raw dollars? Because, well, the schedule is equally important, but I can usually buy more, more time for money. I can't always turn time back into money. Um, and my second question is, how much time is this going to take with the team that we have? And then, how much complexity, which we're going to get to, this is at the game, uh, for the engagement I'm delivering out. When weighing the decision, I mean, these are the three things that you're always costing every decision you make. And as a designer, it's your job to get the most of this for these three things. That's what you always want to be doing. Um, there, are, there are lots of great decisions. There are infinite great decisions you could be uh, choosing to incorporate in any game you make. But we're designing for reality. We're designing for a real planet. We're designing for a real budget, a real team. So when we design, we have to ask ourselves, how am I getting the most bang for my buck? How am I delivering to my audience the best possible product I can, given these two things? So when weighing those, the most difficult of them is this idea of complexity. <laughs> Many players, uh, when they make the jump to want to be designers, uh, want to see lots of depth in their games. And, that's true, that's right, right? Death is great. Um, but one of the things we often don't realize is that it's on a paired axis, that it's on a scale with complexity. Every decision you make in a game adds complexity to that game. Uh, so, even a game as simple as Mario, right? Well, Mario can walk and jump. Well, can he run and jump? Sure. But that adds, that makes the game more complex. It makes it harder to immediately approach. Uh, how many of you guys have played um, Europa Universalis? We've got two, three. So anyway, four, four, all right. Uh, Europa is a great game. If you're a designer, you should check it out. But why is it a great game? Uh, Victoria is a better example of this. It's a great wall. Uh, it's got infinite depth. This is a game that, uh, if you've ever really wanted to micromanage a European economy, down to the individual person during any given day or month of, say, I don't know, the 14th through 17th century, done, they got it for you. But those decisions want a ton of complexity. And so this depth ends up not meaning anything to most of us because engagement is how engaging the depth you, the amount of depth that you provide, minus. The complexity, because something's only as engaging as a player can interface with it, right? And something's only as engaging as a player can actually interact with, uh, uh, with that particular mechanic or system of the game. So, I recently saw a game that required, that was all about rocket jumping, right? And rocket jumping is a 
fascinating thing because rocket jumping is our typical example of a merging game. As a designer of merging gameplay, secretly that you just death you didn't realize was there. Um, but the problem with this game was that wall pointing and shooting is, is simple, it's very direct. Rocket jumping is actually a very complex, uh, a, a very difficult thing to execute, to wrap your brain around for most people. Um, and so this decision, uh, most players couldn't interact with the majority of the game because they could do the pointing and shooting part, but they couldn't do any of the rocket jumping part. And so the team might as well never have built that section because they didn't do enough to deliver that to the player. So your job as a designer is whenever you're adding complexity, weigh that carefully and then do everything you can to mitigate it, right? We've seen lots of different ways. Uh, World of Warcraft has taught us how very much you can ease players into an experience. Um, I remember back when, during the EverQuest days, we believed that MMOs were the most hardcore of experiences. That you would never, ever, ever get uh, 30 year old moms to play an MMO. That was an impossibility. And they showed us that really, if you're really just careful about how you introduce your complexity, you spread it out over a long time, you take each piece, and understand the complexity that that adds to your game, and ramp it down, uh, you can deliver any experience. And these, these couple of simple metrics, your budget, your, your schedule, your complexity, uh, can be taken on the macro level, on your huge overarching experience. You can ask yourself, uh, well, how does, my, how does my whole game concept weigh into complexity? But we can ask that about every little aspect. We take, we take some specific mechanic, same thing, same question. You can look at this across the board. Anything that you're adding to your game should be weighed against those four categories. So, how do you know if you were right in one of the decisions you made? Anyone? People like your game. All right. So how do we know? How do we know if people like our game? Because they're not insulting it. <laughs> <laughs> so I hate to tell you, but the internet means that everyone will insult everyone. <laughs> You're, you're correct, right? Uh, the first way to know we're right, the best way to know we're right, is to go out and play. Um, unfortunately, we need to know we're right earlier in the process than that. You should be getting out to play this as early as possible. If you guys want, I can actually throw a whole other mini lecture about play test because I think it's one of the most important things we do, getting out, getting your product in front of real human beings, and iterating on it as fast as possible. Um, but earlier in the cycle, before that, uh, we have to have some metric as designers to understand whether or not our decisions are, are correct, are, what, are doing what we want them to do. Uh, so, to me, the first and hardest part is to get out of your head. As a designer, you are immensely close to your product. You'll know what you hope to deliver. You'll be very used to uh, the quirks and the difficulties inherent in, um, in the game that you were uh, creating. I actually, I can't say who, but I once was consulting for a project where they literally expected the player to hold the controller upside down. They thought it was great. They thought, oh, man, that, you know. <laughs> as soon as you sat it before anyone who was, a, who was a human being who wasn't your team, you who'd been playing it for 10 years, this game was impossible, right? We had added a lot of artificial components. So your first job as a game designer is to get out of your head and really put yourself in the role of the player. Play your game like a player. But observe your play like a designer. Watch what's happening to you as a designer. Um, all right, so we're observing. Um, and then be totally honest with yourself. One of the hardest things to do as a game designer is uh, to not have that moment where you say, it'll all come together. It'll all work out when, if I just had all the systems in. Um, that's generally not Be completely honest with yourself and be aware of what you're doing. Um, but if you're having a hard time with this, uh, one of the most useful techniques I've found when I'm really trying to move out of just being a, uh, a designer, looking at my own product, and trying to sit myself down and play this thing as a player, is to go find 
something that is similar to project creative. And as much as we all hate to admit it as designers, 90% of anything you do will be similar to things that other people have done. Um, and so there are always these problems. There's always, uh, there's always another shooter you can play next to your shooter. By going doing that, and then going picking back up your controller, and side by side in those experiences, registering what, how you felt while you were playing this crafty piece that you believe uh, executes brilliantly and something that you were trying to execute on, and then playing yours, you'll feel the difference. You'll feel those moments where something seems just a little off. If you're really honest with yourself and you're really observing yourself as you play, uh, you'll be able to capture those moments and drill down and really look into those moments and say, wait, what was I trying to deliver? Where, where is my core engagement for my player? And why is this not solving that as well as uh, this other game? Um, so I've been on a platformer game. I saw this a lot recently. We've seen more and more games that have uh, incredible, realistic, wonderful physics systems that allow us to do a ton. Um, but if you guys don't remember, right, you go play it back, you play your Mario. Uh, your Super Mario Bros, you'll find that Mario can run, jump, and go around. You turn around in the air, and uh, I, I, I haven't quite, I know I'm not going to make that jump. I turn around, and I can land back where I started my jump. But you see a lot of modern games, a lot of modern platformers, you do that run, you do that jump, you turn around, and you miss, and you fall in the bit and die. And the reason for this is because we move the character controller over to the physics system. So you've got preservation momentum. So your player character is now zipping this way, and because he's moving this way, as soon as you press that back button, he doesn't turn on a dime like Mario used to. He slows down, slows down, turns around, and dies. This doesn't deliver on the core experience that we're trying to be, right? Uh, the player has realized their error, wants another crack and leave. There's no reason to punish them further, because you only need to punish them if they have not had any concept that they're making an error. Uh, and you realize this if you're playing these things side by side. But I see game ship all the time with this sort of thing, and then get hammered in the press because, ah, for some reason, these controls don't feel right. Well, as a press person, it's okay to say these controls don't feel right. But as a designer, you should have sat down with another product and really asked, wait, why don't these controls feel as good as this other thing that's trying to do the exact same thing that I'm trying to deliver here? Um, all right. So then there's the big question of innovation. Um, so how do, you, how do you answer the question of I've got a piece of my game that I think is radical, it's new, it's something that nobody's seen before. How do I know if it's good? Well, we in the games industry often love innovation. I mean, I'm probably one of the most guilty of this. I would urge you all to go out and try new things, because I believe it's the only way to pursue the hope, the only way to really improve what we do. But, for all of us, Many of you guys have probably played 10,000 hours of games. You guys have probably played 500,000, 2,000 different games. So at this point, you're jaded, you're biased. You have a, uh, a different experience than your player base will have. Um, and so very often to us, things which are new are in themselves uh, interesting, and really good, even if they're not really good. I always reference this. Have you guys seen a lot of, or even any weird art house films that uh, are just totally out there and you don't get it all, but for some reason the critics thought it was really awesome? The reason is because those critics have to go and see a movie every day of their lives and write about it. They can tell you the generic Hollywood plot art, like back and forth, they can write them themselves, no problem. And so the moment they see something that they couldn't tell you how the whole thing's going to go from the very beginning. Uh, they're like, that's a great thing. We're missing that for most of the people who are trying to serve, it does nothing, right? Uh, so complexity in and of itself isn't always good. Chair, very innovative chair. <laughs> Not necessarily delivering on the core engagement. <laughs> so how do we answer this? We go back to the same question. We just ask yourself, how long you engage with player? And we've had this whole talk, and really the only point of this talk was to, uh, to 
tell you, weigh the bang for your buck on everything against this question. Because this is the most important thing. You can ask this for every single decision that you're making. You say, if you really establish how you want to engage your player, when you say, oh, we should have power-ups, well, does it help how I'm engaging my player? And is it best use of my resources? There's the only two questions. It's really all designing is. Um, so, to me, it's, it's, it's really simple. We, just, we don't build it out thinking. We understand that we're not crafting for ourselves. There's lots of designers wandering the territory of um, uh, building the things that they would love to build. Or the things that they would love to play. But we're building for our player, and you may not be your player. Um, you start by establishing a problem. You're trying to figure out something that you're trying to solve. And once you've got that, you, you build a blueprint. And then you try to execute on that blueprint. Your problem, how do you engage your player? That is the sole and only problem in game design. For the most part. You may have, you may have other challenges. You may, on occasion, be, how, how do I trick the player into giving me as much money as humanly possible? <laughs> But I'm just going to say that the sole and only problem with you, uh, game design is how do I engage my player? And so, uh, with that, I mean, the hardest game design really is just simply creation of purpose. All right. So, thank you guys. I'd love to have Q&A, or if you guys want it, since I did say uh, we can talk more about tests. If anyone's interested in tests, I can often do a spontaneous, on-the-fly mini-lecture about tests. Last half of that. You guys want them? All right, fine. Um, okay, jack it's off. Uh, and this is truly on the fly, so I have no idea how this is going to turn out. But all right, um, so very, very often for small game design, game firms, or for beginning designers, I see this reluctance to test. It's almost a version to test. Uh, they begin testing way too late. I very hear, very often hear. Oh, my players, they're just not going to get it because we're not done enough. Or um, I hear, well, I'm just going to get all the complaints that I already know about. And by the way, if you ever say that, you're, you're totally wrong. It should be in your career. Um, and then uh, I, I get people who have a million other excuses but maybe are just shy, right? For a lot of us, uh, turning our games over to play test is a lot like Playing a song or reading our manuscript to other people, right? This is this is your soul out there, and they're almost certainly going to trample all over. <laughs> so we have to get past it. The first thing I hear from you guys is to let you know that it is literally never too early to play this. As soon as uh, you have blocks moving on the screen, or even often before that, for me. Uh, I will turn up a set of cards to mimic my game, or even grab people from the room. You have no idea how many times uh, I've walked through a scenario, a, uh, a level design, with people. I have one person play the camera, one person play the player, and other people play. And you just walk through the experience, and you learn a ton, right? Uh, you, you can figure out most of those bad camera angle moments. You can figure out where you want to place your cinematic shots by doing nothing but standing up in a room and try to imagine it. If you really have to, duct tape out where the, the room is within the big space here. Um, but all of these things provide us with uh, very valuable data. Um, the reason that going to play test early, well, there's a lot of reasons that going to play test early provide us with value. Uh, as one of the common complaints is that People say, well, my players are only going to tell me the things that I already know. He's, man, I know that a lot's broken. I mean, I know that this is a shooter and our shooting system isn't in yet, so they're probably going to complain about that. I'm like, uh, why don't we just keep building? Um, but the truth is that if that's all you're hearing, you're not doing your job as a designer. Because your job as a designer is to continuously observe, uh, to be cognizant of everything around you. And especially in today's modern world, where things get thrown at us continuously, and um, we often can go back and reference everything that is in front of us at any time. Uh, we miss a lot. Uh, for example, all of you guys, close your eyes. 
I'm still seeing eyes open. Touch that. Okay, I see one or two more. All right, we're good. So, oh, no, no, I see one right there. Eyes. <laughs> uh, so, what's the person next to you wearing? I'm seeing a bunch of you smile. A black t shirt. Uh, well, most of us wear. Easy mode. I know the truth here. Uh, <laughs> uh, that t-shirt, jeans, and converse. But uh, so this is actually a hard thing, right? But it, it shows us. It's just a demonstration of how often, um, how surface level we observe most of the time. As a game designer, you have to get past it. Part of your training is training yourself to observe more deeply. When people give you their feedback on your game, no matter how early, they're telling you what's important to them. So the order they give you their feedback in is critical, right? This is going to tell you a bunch of stuff. This is going to tell you what's most important to them. This is going to tell you where they encounter these problems in your game. You're going to learn what you actually have to fix when and when you have to address them. Because as we all know, we never want to front load a tutorial. So we should find the points where it's going to come up and we're going to actually challenge these things rather than try and solve them all at once. Um, also, <clears throat> playtesting early gives you a wonderful set of data points to adjust from, right? Because yes, you know these things are wrong, but if you actually have data, you have metrics on this sort of thing, what's really going to tell you is was your next decision right? Did you do something that made people feel better about these things? So it's going to tell you your next playtest, the first playtest that you're going to get actually really valuable data on can come early. Uh, so, playtest early. Um, when playtesting, the key things to watch for are anytime that somebody exclaims, anytime that someone groans or has a scream drawn from their soul, you are either doing something extremely right or extremely wrong. Right? Uh, and so just be aware of those moments. Listen carefully. Another thing to do is Watch where they're looking. Um, you can learn a lot by just seeing what the player is spending most of their time staring at. This one's a hard one to do, but for a lot of us, uh, getting a cheap video camera and setting up in their playtest room, not too difficult. Um, also, I see lots of uh, small companies, especially, try to talk to or interview each of the person who played them. This is great, but we really want is you really want to give everybody a survey. Make, you, there's an easy way to set one up on Google Docs, right? Uh, set up a survey for your players. Set up a survey with raw numerical values. These are easy for you to plot and inarguable. There's no way to, uh, to misinterpret these things later on. They allow you to have a completely unbiased player because the player doesn't have to talk to you. Um, and uh, if you leave some space for comments at the end, you'll still get all the feedback that you would otherwise. It also lets you test with a bunch of people at once, which is much more valuable than trying to go up and talk to everybody. Because also there's this incredible thing about the power of the pen. When you're taking feedback from your playtesters, which you should do, just understand that you're biased and you're going to write down uh, things that fit with your biases. Um, very often as designers, it's very easy for us to, especially when we're on the way here, when we feel like we know what's wrong with our game, to write down our players as telling us the things that we know are wrong with our game, rather than things which might be subtly different. Um, also in playtesting, a hugely important one is that we as a species have this urge, we have this innate drive to jump to an answer. Uh, and so very often, y'all get uh, the player telling you things like uh, there weren't enough power-ups on level two. Um, well, that's an answer. What you really want to dig down with them when you do talk to them is to find out why. What was really making them feel? Because the answer may be my main gun just doesn't feel powerful, right? And the solution to that is something totally different than the solution your playtesters need. Your playtesters will give you really good feedback but will often give you very bad solutions. Your job as a designer, the reason that your playtesters aren't designers, is because you're trying to come up with solutions to their problems. They will help you to come up with problems, not solutions. Um, 
your, let's see, what else would we go over about playtesting? Um, do you play your games often, and how do you play them? So we're going to get to that point because my my overarching mental structure for this is how we play test, uh, and then we're going to get to who we play test with next because this is this is a key issue. Yes, you should you should play your games very often, but truth is you are the worst play tester for your game. Um, uh, so. Um, oh, and then lastly, uh, another innate human drive we have. We have this drive to avoid suffering. Um, so most of you guys feel in some way obligated to sit through this talk. So you're going to do it, and you're going to try and be as engaged as possible. But you're going to try that whether or not this talk is very bad. If we locked the room, you would attempt to become engaged in this because Otherwise, your only other option is suffer more. <laughs> this is very often what we do with playtests. We lock players in a room with a thing which is supposed to be engaging, and very often nothing else. You'll see that toy company, I've learned this over the years, you'll never see a toy company do a test in a room that doesn't have a thousand other toys and a television and all this stuff going to see how long the child actually interacts with this thing, when they walk away. Um, if there's no NDA issues, one of the best things to do is go with a bunch of your buddies and have you all bring down your playtest games and at least let the players choose between the games. Because when you launch your games, you're competing against television, film, the internet. Uh, so your game better be more engaging than all those things. You're never going to know if the only situation you test in is, here, come into this room and play this game, right? Um, and so uh, allowing your players that moment where they walk away, that's one of your biggest pieces of feedback. Uh, Oh, and lastly, part two, uh, talking to your players. We often have this urge to explain our games to our players, right? To yep. tell them, oh, that part, it's going to be fixed, right? Or this is how the controls work. Don't do it. Don't do it from the outset, even though you know that you have a bunch of tutorial to make. Or don't do it. You, you're going to learn uh, how your player actually wants to play your game, which is one of the best things you can learn. Sometimes you're wrong. Sometimes when you thought the core game of the game is, you go out to play test and you're like, these guys are just stacking blocks in interesting ways. Maybe our game is actually about stacking blocks. Uh, <laughs> but you also want to learn where, uh, when you're playing encounter systems, where they have trouble. When you're not, so don't, don't tell your player, don't talk to your player. Let your player uh, take a swing or two at your game. And then if you feel the need, explain it to them so you can get more feedback. But uh, resist the urge when you watch it. Because your playlist is very painful. If you haven't gone through a playlist before, personally, what you're going to do is like, turn around, walk into the wall, and then spend 10 minutes doing that. You're going to really want to tell them, you know, actually, there's other things you can do in my game other than like <laughs> see how close you can get to that texture. <laughs> <laughs> But don't. Let them do it to the moment they get bored. Maybe that texture is the most awesome thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Alright, so, uh, next, let's talk about who to playtest with. Play. Um, yes, you are the absolute worst playtester for this game um, because you have just simply gotten too close. You have a bunch of preconceived notions from what you thought you should build from the outset. You have probably played your game a thousand times over the course of building it. Uh, you just know it too intimately. If you ever think your game is hard enough, it's probably one you meant to be too difficult. The same is true if you're, if you're at a large corporation and your play testers tell you, the, the ones you hire, your testers who are mostly their big bugs, that, oh, it's, it, it's, getting, it's getting tough enough. You have gone way beyond any, <laughs> any human being. I'll just test your swing, I think just called not for me. So, you as a player do have to test. You're going to test your game. We just talked about it a little bit. The key when testing your own game is to try and find use any tricks you can to get yourself out of your head as a designer and try and put yourself in a player's position and observe you in the same way you can observe any other player. Um, after that, you've got friends and family. 
Lots of us test with friends and family or office mates. All these people have a social obligation to you to <laughs> not hurt your feelings or at least probably see you tomorrow. <laughs> so, <laughs> you that your game actually made them want to end their existence. <laughs> the internet is wonderful for this. If you ever want to have people tell you just the length to which your, the, your game made them violently ill, the internet will do that for you. Um, internet's actually a great place. If you guys are doing flash games, like uh, testing in a totally anonymous environment is fantastic. Um, but what you want to do is get uh, play testers who have no exposure to the Now, a lot of us know a lot of hardcore gamers. Uh, hardcore gamers, again, uh, not the best group to test your game with, unless that is the sole and only audience, and it's a niche we're reducing. Um, because there's a lot of convention that we're used to, right? Um, if I'm building an RTS and right click doesn't move, <laughs> we laugh, right? Like, we're going to be upset about that. It might not be the correct solution for your particular RTS, but every one of us is going to be like, <laughs> <laughs> Really? <laughs> so, <laughs> test one come on a long term. What was that? Come on a long term once. Didn't have the right button. Uh, Doom 2? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Age of Empires Online just, well, just sort of say, came out and you don't move with the right thing. Well, yes, it does. You sure? <laughs> so remember, our job there was something that was working. Uh, no two designers. I really want to know. I will let you guys go resolve that. Uh, <laughs> I will also be taking side bets on their resolution. <laughs> um, so, uh, hardcore gamers, next worst. Uh, then people have played your game before, right? Often we recycle our play history. Every time somebody plays your game, you're going to get worse feedback. Because they're used to things. They're not going to tell you these things. Uh, try not to recycle your play history. It's really easy to get people to play a game. Maybe not for long, but, I mean, uh, Simply post a handbill somewhere and say, hey, game was going to be tested this time. You'd be shocked the number of people you get. I have my students gorilla uh, do play tests in malls until we get kicked out um, all the time. Because you want to grab average people, right? Like, the average gamer is not actually the hardcore gamer. And we're even talking for consoles. Um, uh, so, oh, the bets, it may not be your party audience. So you want to run your test with your party audience. Um, but to me, the absolute best testers I've ever had have been little kids. Little kids would be brutally honest with you. <laughs> so enthusiastic. <laughs> so let's see. That, so we've gone over who to test with. We've gone over how to test. Um, we've gone over when to test. Is there any other? Is there any other questions I'm missing? Any other thoughts? How long? How long should you test? Uh, how many? So you should be testing, uh, since I've said as early as possible, as many as possible, right? Um, you should be testing as continuously as you can in the as a designer. A large part of our job is to understand and interpret that, that feedback. Uh, as far as how long, well, how long do you think your game is going to be? To me, let's see how long people play it, right? We don't want to put any defined assumptions in there, right? Like, we don't want to cast anything. We want to say, how long do you want to play this game for? Well, if it's only engaging for 10 minutes, we better make the average game length of 10 minutes and put it on an iPhone and Facebook, right? But if the average play length we follow is 10 minutes, and then playing for three hours, all right, cool. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing something right. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, then, then we're doing good. So, what about the, so when do you do play testing in the process of many? Uh, I mean, I start before we start coding. Um, I literally start playtesting. And when do you finish the testing? Uh, so, I have, I have this skewed view on things. I believe that you are, that you are essentially never done testing because when you ship, right, you're going to get this huge playtest pool. You get tons of feedback from lots of sources. And as a designer, I can't help look at that and be like, ah, oh, you know, I knew all this a month ago. These are the things that we would do. Uh, but sooner or later, you got shit, right? Like, you finish playtesting, or you're 
when you know you're going to run out of money. Uh, <laughs> other questions, thoughts? Uh, are, are the positive feedbacks always positive? What do you mean? Uh, I mean, uh, how do you, how do you, you uh, are going to, to, to if, if a player gives you a positive feedback, uh, how do you uh, take that feedback uh, to, to your game design? I mean, you should, uh, you should use it in your favor, keep it like that. Um, so Is the player honest? There's, there's a group of answers to that. I mean, if you if you have a really bad mechanic and the player give you uh, good feedback, and uh, I mean, what 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 should I do? I change it. I give it in the, the same way. So I, I really wanted to do a sarcastic answer, but I'm actually going to do the real one. <laughs> <laughs> so this is why we do a lot of things, right? because uh, I don't know how many of you guys took any statistics, but uh, a you're looking for a significant sample size, right? Like you're looking for a statistically significant sample size. And if one dude loves the fact that, like, uh, he dies every two seconds from falling in the pits, uh, <laughs> or that falling through the world geometry is the most awesome thing ever, you should play the video. Well, it's probably wrong. <laughs> He has everyone on the other big answers was like, oh, but I felt the world geometry, what a bummer. If all of your players are like, whoa, I felt the world geometry, and then we were in the surrealist wonderland, <laughs> maybe you should be making a surrealist game because it's better than the game you're <laughs> So, the easiest way to know is just take the average, right? This is why we play with a lot of games. Other thoughts, questions? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Uh, why do people play games? Why do people play <laughs> what? Uh, uh, they just don't escape the banal mind of the album. Oh, uh, so why do people play games? I mean, there's a million answers to that, right? I think that everybody in this room probably has a different answer to why they play games. And my guess is if you were to, uh, if, if I were to pose that question to you, right, you would probably have a different answer on a different given day, right? Uh, games give us a lot of things. There are different. All right, fair enough. Uh, we've, we've hit the five minute warning, which we're clearly going to do. So, it can be anything from getting something you don't get in real life, being rewarded and being feeling powerful for your intellect or your ability to lateral think, um, to a way to relax, right? It's like asking, why do people watch TV? It's very different. I mean, or watch movies, right? Like, I watched Schindler's List for a totally different reason than I would say why. I wouldn't watch it. Uh, I, I did watch it for so. uh, <laughs> But I wouldn't say I would watch them for the same reasons, right? No, I <laughs> There's no man Fox in Schindler's List. What's that? There's no man Fox in Schindler's List. Yeah. How do you deal with uh, when you encounter this problem where you have an opinion, you are the designer, right? But there's some other pieces in your team, maybe developers, maybe producers, maybe artists, that just have this idea that they won't let go. And you don't know if you're right. I mean, the game hasn't shipped yet, but you have to argue in your favor. How do you deal with that? So it depends on their team, right? Um, for all of you guys, as a designer, your core skill is communication, is being able to, to deliver the essence of your idea simply to all the other people on your team. Um, so, in a lot of cases, I mean, playtest is a great way, right? Like, if you got data, then you can be like, yo, everybody said you're stupid, so you're just like, done. That, that usually solves things. Yeah. Um, uh, everybody thinks they can design, right? One of the Easiest ways, although this is this is a roll of the dice. Uh, I I had a situation where this happened to me, where I literally said, "Okay, cool, get me a spec, design it, get it totally set up, gray box it for me, and we'll try it out." It never got done. Right? <laughs> Solved. Do uh, <laughs> <laughs> you work in design? How many people are not interested in? Uh, in design, or rapidly realize how it's in this idea. Or, if it's cheap, I mean, throw it in. It's 
it's good, right? Like there's no there's no reason not to. Um, in some companies, I've seen design decisions the the uh, total purview of the designer only the designer gets to say anything. In some cases, I've seen them the designer be the arbiter, so everybody can throw stuff at the designer, and the arbiter and the designer gets to decide which ones go in the game. And uh, in some cases, I've seen it be much more democratic. Democratic. Unfortunately, to be totally honest with you, most of the totally democratic ones I've seen end up as a mess that never gets something shipped. Um, but yeah, I would say playtest is if it's cheap, um, and if it's not, if it's something that's going to be totally nuts, let them try and convince it, right? Because it's never going to happen. You're never, you're never going to get that underwater werewolf scene that needs to have a whole like uh, fur underwater rendering engine to be able to deliver on. So cool, make it happen. Um, and if they want to put it out of fiction hard, then we can play. Uh, other questions? Yes. Okay. What about the policy from authority? What happens if the people from higher up they tell you that you have to do this like this? We're going to take this idea regardless of how stupid it is, and you have to design around it. So this is actually one of this is a personal decision for you um, because your option is to work a lot harder. Uh, what you have to do is build the thing that they want to build, to build the thing that's better. Let them side by side it, show them real results, show them that you were right, and that this thing is not going to pay them as much money or get yeah. them the bank issues or whatever they care about, right? Show them that there's a better alternative. Uh, but it means that you're probably going to be putting in a ton of overtime. And I mean, I've done it before, right? If you really care about a game, you're really passionate about it, and you want to save it from your corporate oligarch who's making you into a place just stupid. <laughs> Heroes, city villains, all those sort of things. 
University of Films, probably never actually shipped it. <laughs> All right, um, superhero game, right? Built when uh, EverQuest, EverQuest time period. Um, and they were over budget, over scope. And their publisher, they, they missed a couple of things, the publisher said to them, you guys need to convince us by essentially Wednesday that you guys have, there's a game you can ship. Otherwise, we are pulling them off. And so they all sat in a room. Everybody was like, team leaders all sat in a room and spitballed like this for a whole day and like, couldn't find anything, couldn't figure anything, couldn't figure anything. Finally, somebody in frustration said, well, what if we just cut the equipment system? Right? Imagine everybody's like, imagine wow. And some designer on wow being like, you know what we don't need? We could probably cut that equipment system. <laughs> <laughs> and then they did it, right? And they shipped their game. And they made a fantastic game that because the core fund was in being a superhero and in their powers, uh, they didn't need equipment system, right? Superheroes in general don't have a, they don't switch their equipment all the time, right? Uh, it's just not what they do. So they can do it. Um, having those moments, realizing those things, are probably uh, one of the, will make you a very strong designer. Or be as that much possible. As far as actually how you kill your games. <coughs> just know you'll always have other good ideas. Um, anyway, else? Yes? Aside from measuring engagement and game testing early, what are the classic mistakes you see repeated with students and young designers? Oh, uh, so this one, this one is easy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if you want to make God of War, and you've got three months, four guys with one built a game, you are not making God of War. Uh, with students and young designers, so as a designer, I, I put it a little bit of a nebulous thing, but to me, your job is scope, right? Uh, you are one of the key people who can sync a project by defining something that's going to uh, take much longer than you possibly have the resources to deliver. Um, so for all my, when I teach a game, and one of the, I make them build a game a month, every month, on a different genre, and just toss their ideas at the end of the month, because one of the things it does is, um, it helps them get a sense of the cost of the decisions. Because I make them do all the sound, make them do all the animations, all the art, I make them do all the scripting, and then of course I make them do all the design. Uh, and so in doing so, they start they start understanding that, hey, if I want to mantle up, I'm gonna cost my animator three weeks of their time, right? Is that really worth it? Um, and so, in poor scope is one, and then another one is thinking your ideas are precious. Uh, for all of you guys, I could, we could do an exercise if we had time where I'd ask you, write down 10 game ideas. You all have at least 10 game ideas that you want to build. Um, all those game ideas are potentially good. The games are all about the execution of those ideas. I mean, we talked about, uh, I use this a lot, but I mean, Bioshock, and around first person shooter on the water. That, that makes no sense. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you get Mario, he's going plumber, he jumps. <laughs> All right. Uh, we had a Mari. We got <laughs> So, I mean, all the ideas you can, there is a game that you can make out of the event so fast, and it's great. Um, and so just being able to uh, start slashing through your ideas when you realize it. I didn't even step on this one before. This one's too expensive for right now, right? So go on to something else. Don't be immediately committed to building things that um, that you really want to play. Oh, and don't build for you. I see a lot of young designers build games that they want to play rather than build games that they think anyone else will play. Um, other questions? All right. I am tired. <laughs> okay, one last question. This is game design. I want to ask you. What good books would you recommend to increase the lexicon and be able to better differentiate the elements of the game? So, as I said, uh, design of everyday things is a great thing. But to me, as a game designer, you really need to reach past the game design books. Right? Like, I can clearly recommend Jesse Jell's book of wins. You, you great book. You have a microphone? Yep. Oh, let's, uh, where is it? 
So I could I, I could tell you just shows with lenses. I could tell you um, uh, exaggerated things. Uh, but really, what I want to see you do is I want to see you have other areas to reach from, right? Like go read your Iliad and your Odyssey. Go read your Shakespeare. Um, go have other life experiences to uh, bring into your content because that's that's where you're really gonna get stuff. Do things which force you to think laterally, and then do things which force you to think logically outside of the realm of the game entirely. Uh, because that is really what's going to give you the ability to pull apart and deliver interesting mechanics. Move on to more than coding. So basically, you're saying just go on stuff like me, right? Well, not entirely, of course. One, one should always examine the games, right? Like, you should always try and deconstruct the things you're playing. And you're always going to consume them as a form of media, right? And there are games which are at least as valid a form of media, um, or an example of a form of media, as any book or piece of television. Um, so I would never say, stop playing games. I would say, don't have games be the only thing that you have any experience with. Um, so yeah, don't, be, don't let games be the only media that you consume, right? Yes. Um, because you'll draw in from all I mean, almost every great game that you can name, uh, if, you, if you look at the origins of, of Mario or Zelda, right? Zelda's walking around the hills in Japan, right? That's, that's, that's what got us there. Um, for most of these great games, you'll find a story like that where the inspiration wasn't games themselves. Um, they just have tried to deliver that engagement that they found somewhere in reality in a compressed format in a game. Um, all right, should we clear out of here? Is this every time? I'm not. I'm not seeing people kick us out. <laughs> All right. Uh, any other last questions, comments? Oh wait, we've got. Oh god. Yeah. Um, <laughs> all right, that was a mistake. I should. I should fled while I did. Um, all right. Shoot. Give me yours. Okay. Going a little back to the beginning of your talk uh, about budget. Uh, you once said that you spent about seven. A amount of time raising money for your for, for your profit. So how do you manage your the the budget, the money that you that you have raised? How do you distribute it? Because it must be really hard to raise the money for your project, and, and it must be really sad to have I know to have another people like uh, I don't know using it badly or something. I keep all my artists chained to a desk. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, honestly, um, I hate raising money. I'll be totally frank, I need it. I would do it again if I have to, but uh, Jesse, Jesse Shell once said to me, you will spend your entire career either building other people's games or getting people to build your games. This sucks. <laughs> it's no longer as true, right? We have a lot of new avenues for distribution. You can actually bootstrap a game company through making iPhone games, through making Facebook games, through making XBLA games. Um, and to me, that's just a better way to do it. It's still, it, it's still um, tough in some ways to distribute those funds because you know if you, if you could just hold on to a little bit more of that money, the next game you could deliver would be that much more awesome. But there's always more money. Go find it. Um, to me, the thing, uh, when I got my first industry job, I was so broke that they called me up and said, hey, we need to go out here at Activision in two weeks, right? Um, and uh, I said yes. And I knew that the flight to getting out there would cost me everything but $28 I had in the bank. So my first, my first several weeks at Activision, until I got my first paycheck, I slept on the beach. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I kind of put, put things in perspective, but I came around the van, slept in the van a bunch, and what it, realized, what it made me realize is that's the worst it's going to get. Right? Most of you guys are highly educated. Most of you guys have a lot of talent in some area that you find you you're really better by going through the industry. So you can't be you can't be afraid of those moments, right? Like fear is the thing that's going to kill us. Being you want to be intelligent about how you spend your money, but miserly is something that will kill a company faster than anything else. So I, I would say um, just keep careful track of your of your scope, of your budget, right? Like know beforehand how much you can spend and how much you think things are going to cost. And then 
multiply that by 150%. And I, mean, I literally do have all my budget, by the way. I actually do multiply by 150% because we're not science, right? You're not going to be able to uh, create a game on the schedule and on the budget that you lay out on a spreadsheet way beforehand. Um, and so, if you, so long as you leave yourself enough buffer and make sure you have enough cash in the bank to hit that buffer, and then six months after, you're going to actually get money from people when you sell that game. Um, uh, you should be fine. And then don't sweat it. Like, uh, I'm, I'm not particularly in games for cash. Every time I make a bunch of cash making games, I go spend it on the next thing that I think is interesting, right? Try and make the next interesting game. Um, so if dollars are what you want, you're not going to find them here, right? Like, your skills are better used elsewhere. But if you love this medium, don't worry about it. This is my answer. All right. Uh, other people back there. I saw. Oh wait. I guess I lied. Go for it. Yeah. Why not? All right. Do you have any tips on the problems of communication between designers and programmers? Yes, actually, I do. Um, <laughs> uh, bet neither of us were expecting me to say that. Uh, so I have one totally practical tip that. Uh, I, 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 I see. So, a <laughs> um, couple of them. If you ever want a programmer to read a document, um, pictures. I found that a lot of programmer mindset, you throw pictures in, not where they're most valuable, but where you want them to stop. Because they have to figure out the picture. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> oh. Some of the best programmers I've ever met are, um, I, I hate to say it this way, but it's actually true. Some of the best programmers I've ever met also have severe Asperger's, right? And have a really hard time communicating. They're very introverted, hard time communicating with another human being. And so I, I've had multiple occasions where someone will come up who I can't really communicate with. And um, I, I spent, when I first started, I couldn't get through to a good guy, right? He'd come over, mumble something, and walk away from my cube. <laughs> so that, I was building some levels, right? And I had this uh, uh, pile of Legos on my desk. And he comes up and he starts assembling the Legos. And now he's totally capable of just spewing out the information that he needs to spew out while he's doing something else. He doesn't have to actually interact with me. He's only interacting with Legos and just spewing information. <laughs> uh, uh, but for the most part, I mean, uh, be reasonable and get some understanding because the main thing for your programmers is also respect their time. They have a very highly honed craft and as a designer, make sure that your requests of them are reasonable and make sure that you detail your request to a level that they understand the, what they have to build rather than uh, saying you want something that might cost an extra few weeks of time, right? Uh, just be really respectful. I found that there's a lot of reciprocity with it. So, uh, all right, uh, we've got lights up. We're all clapped. That's apparently. Una charla necesitamos un adaptador de BIBGA.